And so today, what I want to be talking about uh, is the importance of a devotional life. And so, for those of you that may not have grown up in the church or may not have been a Christian long uh, and don't know what a devotional life is, a devotional life is the spiritual discipline of reading and meditating on God's Word on a daily basis. Uh, This is something that I'm incredibly passionate about. It's stuff that changes our lives. And um, in the past few years that I've been doing college ministry and just kind of observing the church and speaking with other Christians, I have found that a lot of Christians and a lot of people have a very high view of Scripture, but they don't actually take the time to read it. They think, oh, that's a holy book, that's a sacred book, I totally respect it, but I don't actually take the time to read it. And, and for someone who is very passionate about the Word of God, who loves reading his Bible, I'm like, man, you are missing the best part. Like one of the, some of the best times in my day are sitting down with the Lord and reading his Word. Um, in fact, so the American Bible Society, I was doing some research on this, and they did a recent survey in 2016 and found that only one-third of Christians read their Bible once a week. That's really not a great statistic, and so that's one thing that I uh, strive to change. And so kind of in response to, the, to this issue, uh, one of the ways that I kind of saw it with the Lord and, uh, on how to remedy this, um, I created kind of this lesson that I would walk through with people one-on-one called the devotional experience. Because I found that a lot of people don't like to read their Bibles for a couple of reasons. Either it feels like a chore, it's like, okay, I'm a Christian, I know I'm supposed to read my Bible, but I kind of feel guilted into it, and so I don't really want to read it. Uh, so they think that it feels like a chore, or they think that it's too boring, or too intimidating. And so like, it's a big book, it's really confusing, I don't know where to start, and so I kind of just don't want to deal with it, so I put it on the shelf and I let it collect dust. And so I made this devotional experience lesson to kind of change people's perspective on the way that we should read our Bibles. Um, and so what this devotional experience is, is a series of scriptures that I walk people through Um, one-on-ones that is meant to change their perspective on devotions. Uh, It is my goal that when people walk out of this, that by the grace of God, they can walk out with understanding foundational concepts that help them view devotions, reading God's word, as a privilege rather than a chore. And so, with the, the, the couple days I had to prepare, what I've done is I've taken my devotional experience uh, and I made it into a sermon. So together as a church, we can walk through Uh, these scriptures, and I pray that by God's grace, we will walk out of here with some foundational concepts and perspectives on the Word of God that will make us view reading God's Word as a privilege rather than a chore. Um, So cards on the table, I got to be honest, I really want you guys to read your Bible. I really want you guys to get in God's Word because it is one of the primary ways that we grow closer to God and move closer into this intimacy that He offers us. And so that's truly the goal of my sermon. Um, And so before I begin, I want to give you guys a quick outline of what uh, I will be doing here today. First, we're going to be looking at two key principles everyone needs to know before reading the Bible. And then we're going to look at kind of the goal of devotion. So it's like, okay, I know I should be reading my Bible, but when I sit down and read it, what should I be looking for? Uh, So with that in mind, let's pray, and then we'll dive into the scripture that we have for us today. So let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we love you. And we're so grateful uh, that you have sent your son to die in our place, that we uh, have this ability to pray with you, to have this ability to have this relationship with you. We thank you for your word. We know that it is truth. We know uh, that it changes us and molds us. And so, Lord, I pray that today we will leave with our hearts stirred to seek you through uh, your word and that we would continue to, to grow, draw closer into this intimacy that you offer us, Lord God. Please speak through me today. Please speak through your word. May your words Uh, be preached and not mine. In Christ's name I pray, amen. So we are going to be going through uh, a fair amount of scripture today, so buckle in. If you can keep up with me, that's great, but if not, I have put the uh, scriptures on the screen for us to read together. So we're going to be beginning in Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. So Psalm 1 says, boom, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in all that he does he prospers. So before we move further, I just think it's important for us to understand what this law is. See, the psalm says that the person is blessed if he meditates on the law day and night. And so for the people in that context, 
The law of God was Leviticus and Deuteronomy, all the rules and regulations that God had given his people for which they were to be governed and which they were to obey and follow. Um, and so, uh, yeah, which they were to follow and obey. Now, the reason I want to read this to you is to show you that in the Old Testament, there is a theme running throughout the scriptures that highlights the importance of meditating on God's law. So as it says in Psalm 1, a person is blessed if they meditate on God's law day and night. We also see in Joshua chapter 1, which we're not going to turn to, but in Joshua chapter 1, when God is commissioning Joshua to lead the people of Israel into the promised land, he says that one of the most important things that you need to be doing is meditating on the law day and night, not turning from it to the left or the right, uh, but having it flow from your mouth and have it uh, be the motivation behind everything you do. We also see in Deuteronomy that God commands the people of Israel uh, to talk about the law as they go about their day, to teach it to their children, uh, to... Uh, think about it when they go to bed and when they wake up. So we see that it's important to God that his people meditate on his law. But I want us to move to Psalm 19, which is written by King David, to gain a better understanding of why this is so important. So, Psalm 19 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes, and the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. So this psalm can be pretty confusing. Because it seems like David is just in love with this law. I almost read this psalm and think, all right, get a room, David. Like, you and the law, like, have this issue here. Um, and for those of us in the 21st century, this is very confusing to us. Because if we're being honest, Leviticus and Deuteronomy is where Bible in a year plans go to die. Because we start reading them and we're like, this is incredibly boring. This doesn't apply to me. Why on earth is this in here, Lord? And so, yet... Uh, it shows in Scripture that at least some of God's people, including King David, the leader of Israel, they have this intense love for the law. And so my question when I read this is, why is that? Because I certainly don't have this intense love for the law. I don't describe it as sweeter than honeycomb. I describe it as, let's flip over to Joshua and get some, some action going. And so the answer, I believe, I think there's a lot of reasons why the Israelites love the law, but the answer, I believe, is in the adjectives used to describe the law. So we see in this psalm that David describes the law as perfect, sure, right, and pure, just sweeter than honeycomb, much to be more, de more desired than gold, and just this really affectionate and incredible high view of the law. Now, we see that these adjectives are used to describe the law, but who else do they describe? We see that this also describes the Lord, because the Lord is perfect, the Lord is pure, the Lord is right, the Lord is more to be desired than gold because he is so incredible. And I think that this is important because of the, one of the main reasons why the Israelites loved the law so much was because it revealed the character of God. And so God's character was revealed through the law that he gave to his people. Now, I know that a lot of you are probably sitting here thinking, okay, Sean, that's cool and all, like really using your biblical studies degree, but what on earth does this have to do with what we're talking about? What does this have to do with devotions? I'm really glad you asked that question because uh, I have the answer in my notes. <laughs> so the reason I brought you through all that scripture is to convey an important principle, um, and that is what we need to understand, and that is that God desires to reveal himself to his people. And so we see this all throughout scripture, that since the beginning of time, since Adam and Eve fell, like the Lord has been slowly but surely revealing more and more of himself to his people. So we saw that in the giving of the law, as we just saw. We saw that um, in the prophets that bore witness to, to the Lord. And then we also see it fully more realized when Jesus Christ has come. Because Jesus, uh, or the scriptures say that Jesus is the image of God, that Jesus is the exact imprint of God's nature. And so all throughout the Bible, we see the God revealing more and more of himself until he revealed himself fully in the person of Jesus Christ. And so... Uh, this leads us into today where we have this book that is full of the law, that is full of uh, the stories of Jesus Christ, that is full of the prophets that all speak about God's character. 
And so if we took the time to seek him through his word, we would realize that the Lord wants to reveal himself to us through his word. So that is principle number one that we need to understand, which leads me into the next principle. So we're going to be reading from Isaiah 55, which is one of my favorite passages of scripture. I do have a lot, though. Um, So Isaiah 55 says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. So in this passage, the Lord is inviting his people uh, into the blessings that he is offering. And now if some of you have grown up in the church, you probably have heard the next scripture that we're going to look at that looks a lot like Isaiah 55. Uh, This is from Jesus. Oh, maybe not. Okay, we missed that one, so I'll just read that one. So that is in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, where Jesus says to the people of Israel and to the people in general in the Gospels, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest to your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is life, light. So there's a lot of things that we could talk about in these two passages, but the one thing that I want to focus on is that God is inviting his people into the blessings of relationship with him. We see that in the Old Testament and we see that in the New Testament with Jesus, inviting people to enjoy the blessings of a relationship with him. And so this principle highlights, which we've already kind of got a preview of, the principle that this highlights is that God desires a relationship with his creation. And both of these principles are incredibly important for us when we want to enter into our time of the uh, reading of God's words. So this relationship that he offers to us is a free gift for anyone that chooses to accept it. And this is nothing new to people in the church. I'm sure all of you are thinking, yes, I know this, Sean. I know that God desires a relationship with me. I understand that God reveals himself to me. But I really want to take the moment to really let this point sink in. Because the God of the universe, who spoke everything into being, who created each and every one of you, is offering to us a relationship with himself. And not only is he offering, but he desires a relationship with us. And he desires to reveal himself to us. Because all throughout Scripture we see this. Ever since the fall of man where Adam and Eve sinned and that severed their relationship with God, God has been unfurling an incredible plan of redemption that climaxed in the cross of Jesus Christ. And so because all of us have sinned, or because all of us have fallen short of the glory of God, Jesus had to come and die for our sins in our place and then rose again three days later that if we place our faith in him, we can have a relationship with God. And this is the good news of the gospel. This is incredible because um, this is offered to everyone. As we see in both of these scriptures that we just read, that God offers this to anyone who thirsts, anyone who has no money. This is offered to all people. So no matter where you are, no matter what you have done, Jesus Christ has paid for your sins. And if you place your faith in him, you can have eternal life and eternal fellowship and eternal relationship with the God of the universe. That's incredible. And so this is not just a principle to understand, but this is the principle of the Christian faith. We are given not just heaven when we place our faith in Christ, but we are given a relationship with God that we are able to cultivate in this life through the reading of his word. And so um, I believe that one of the biggest reasons uh, a lot of us kind of just get into this rut of like, okay, I go to church, I do small group, I just kind of pray every now and again. But like the Lord of the universe is offering us an incredible relationship that we can have by reading his word. And I think that oftentimes we miss the best part. Because again, some of the best day, like parts of my days and the best parts of the, a lot of people I know that are in the word, that are in scriptures, are when they have those intimate times with the Lord of just journaling and praying and seeking the Lord through scripture. And so continuing to move forward, this brings me to the, my final point, um, understanding the two principles that God reveals himself to us through his word and that he desires a relationship with us, we come to the question, okay, like I understand this and I understand that I can have a relationship with God through his word, but what should I be looking for? What is kind of the goal of devotions? When I enter into my time of reading the scriptures, what am I looking for? And for that answer, we're going to go again to another psalm, which is Psalm 27, which we read at the beginning of this. Uh, One of my favorite psalms. Oh, hey, there it is. 
Yeah, you can read that later. <laughs> so Psalm 27, verses 1 through 8. Uh, David writes, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his, uh, in, hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. That's the end there. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon the rock, and now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Israel, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face, and my heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. So a pretty incredible song that I, a song that I really encourage you guys uh, to read in your quiet times with the Lord. Um, but the reason this is one of my favorite songs is because of David's attitude towards God and the response to his desperate situation. We see in the beginning of this psalm that David is in a really intense circumstance, that all these things are going wrong around him, that enemies are attacking him from either side, and yet the only thing that he asks of the Lord is to gaze upon his beauty, to sit in his temple, to just have a relationship with him. And that's incredible because out of that, the Lord provides for him. The Lord saves him from his enemies. The Lord keeps him away, all because David desired this relationship with him. He's like, more than anything, what I want is to just gaze upon your beauty. And so, David was a man after God's own heart, and he's a prime example of the goal of devotional time. And for the goal is simple. All we need to do is seek to know God more. That gives us our quote-unquote goal of devotion, seeking to know God more. I talked about this in my last sermon um, where I really encourage you guys to seek the Lord through his word and just seek to grow in your knowledge of him. Because when we grow in our knowledge of God, we grow in our love for God. Because he is so perfect and incredible, when we learn more about him, we grow in our love for him because we're like, wow, Lord, you truly are who you say you are. And so uh, as we grow in our knowledge of God, we will grow in our love for him, and this love will change us into the people that we were created to be. I talked about that in my last sermon. Um, all we need to do is open our Bibles and pray, Lord, I just want to know you more. I just want to seek your face. I just want to believe that you exist and that you reward those who earnestly seek you. And so, as I've said before, this entire book, I don't have my Bible with me, but pretend I do, this entire book is about God. And so every law, every epistle, every chapter and gospel is revealing to us the character of the God of the universe that desires to reveal himself to us and desires a relationship with us. Both of these are incredible truths. And so a, pr a simple practical takeaway uh, for you guys, if, if you're wondering, okay, Lord, okay, Sean, like I understand that I need to be reading my Bible. I understand that I should be doing devotions, uh, but kind of where do I start? A simple practical takeaway for, for you guys to do is to open your Bibles to the Gospel of John. Because the Gospel of John is the, is the uh, gospel that is written to the entire world, and it's a very simple gospel. And so when you're reading that, I encourage you to ask yourself two questions. First, ask yourself, what is this telling me about God? And as I mentioned above, Jesus is the exact imprint of the nature of God. And so when we read about Jesus, when we learn more about Jesus, we are learning more about the character of God. And so after you ask that first question, ask yourself, now how does this passage, uh, what this passage says about God, how does this affect the way I live my life today? And this is a very simple thing that you can do throughout the Bible. Oh, hold on. There it is. Ask yourself, what does this passage tell me about God? And then how does this principle about God apply to myself today? I'll give you a quick uh, example of what this looks like in my own life. And then I'll ask Sean to come back up and we'll close in prayer and worship. Uh, most of you guys, if you guys have grown up in the church, know the story of Samson. Samson was the strongest man alive. He did a lot of really cool things, and then, but he disobeyed God a lot, and he ended up getting his eyes gouged out, and it was just a whole mess. But he ends up uh, destroying a lot of the Philistines because God comes to him right at the last second and allows him to accomplish his purpose despite his imperfections. And a lot of people read the story of Samson and think, okay, like I shouldn't isolate myself like Samson did. I shouldn't 
uh, uh, follow the desires of my heart because I know that they're really evil and that's what Samson did and led him to destruction so I can learn that and I'd be good to go. But truly what the story of Samson is showing us is that God works his perfect plan through imperfect people. Because Samson, at the beginning of his life, was said, you're going to take out the Philistines. You're going to do a lot of stuff against God's enemies. And throughout the story of Samson, we see that through Samson's imperfect actions, God's perfect plan is accomplished. And so that is an incredible truth of the Lord. Because we are all imperfect people. But despite our imperfections, the perfect God of the universe is able to work perfectly through us. It's this brilliant paradox of the Bible that I'm so in love with. And so I can read that scripture, understand that truth, and be comforted to know that when I do imperfect things, God will work, it, work his perfect plan through that. And so, for example, like this sermon today, quickly rushed, like at the last minute, it is definitely nowhere near perfect. It is quite imperfect. But I can be confident that the God of the universe is working his perfect plan through my imperfect sermon. And so with that, if you guys have any questions, if anything was not clear in the sermon today, I encourage you to come talk to me afterwards. Again, what I want you guys to be doing is, is getting in the word of God, growing in your relationship with him, understanding that he desires to reveal himself to you and desires a relationship with you. So I'm going to close us in prayer and ask Sean to come back up and close us in worship, uh, and then we can head on out of here. All right, let's pray. Mm -hmm.